Well, good morning and welcome to another teaching. It is a Saturday morning here in Texas and hopefully y'all just rocking in Jesus. I mean, rocking in Jesus. I mean, just growing in Jesus, spending time with Jesus, just growing in your intimacy with Jesus, growing to experience Jesus and growing just to just to to to, to understand the meaning and purpose and the life and the power that you have in your relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord. I mean, it is the meaning of life. I mean, <laughs> hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Wow. All right. All right. Today, Lord willing, we're going to finish the second half of Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 32. Just good stuff. Uh, we had talked about last time that in the first three chapters of Ephesians, uh, the Apostle Paul was was outlining, you know, uh, who we are in Christ, all that's been done for us in Christ, and how by the grace of God, by the unmerited favor of our Father, not because of anything we've done, um, that Christ came and lived for us and died for us and gave His life for us. And that we were saved by his grace, right? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works so that no one can boast, right? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works so that no one can boast, right? Um, and, you know, he just consistently outlines you know, uh, just all that was accomplished in Christ on our behalf. He talks about how we are no longer separated, right? There's no more division between Jewish people and non-Jewish people, Gentiles, right? How in Christ, we all have equal access to the triune God. And he, in Ephesians 1 and in, uh, in chapter 3, he gives the two incredible prayers that, you know, we all ought to be praying, right? You remember in Ephesians 1, um, Paul says, I pray that our heavenly father would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you would know him better, right? He prays that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened so that we would know the hope to which you have called us, that we know the riches of our glorious inheritance in the saints, and that we would know the incomparably great, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, our Lord, right? Then you move over into chapter three and Paul prays that we would be strengthened right? By the Holy Spirit, our Father would strengthen us by his Holy Spirit in our inner being, in our inner man, so that Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith, that, you know, Jesus wouldn't just be a visitor, but he'd dwell in our hearts by faith. Paul goes on to pray that we would be rooted and established in love so that we would know how high and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, right? You see the cross there. That's the only way we'll ever understand how high and long and wide and deep is the love of Christ, is when you see that cross, and that we would know this love that surpasses knowledge, right? That we would really come to know the love of Christ beyond head knowledge, that we would be filled to all the measure of the fullness of God. And then, you know, thank you, Lord. Then as he moves into chapter four now for uh, the second half of the book, you know, he's going to now speak to us how we need to live our lives in light of all that Christ has done on our behalf, right? Um, so the book transitions beginning in chapter four to how we're to live our lives in light of this incredible grace of God given to us, right? Um, how we're to respond as Christians, meaning after we've received Christ as savior, you know, how are we to live? And so we did verses one to 16 last time. Today, we're going to Lord willing, do 17 to 32. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your favor, your mercy, your goodness, and your grace on our lives. Father, we thank you that we have this Bible, Lord. I thank you that I have this Bible here on this iPad, Lord. We thank you that we have the living word of God, Father. We thank you that you've given us your word and for the privilege it is to have your word in our lives. Father, we just thank you and we praise you today. But Father, above all, we do thank you for Jesus, our only Lord and Savior and, and Master and King. Lord Jesus, we thank you for becoming a human man for us. 
We thank you for living a perfect life for us. We thank you for dying a torturous death for us. And we thank you that you are alive and risen today. And we worship you today, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us and guide us now as we open your word. We ask you to give us eyes to see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 17, Paul says, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Wow, thank you, Lord Jesus. Bam. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Lord. All right. <clears throat> That's just good stuff. All right. So Paul starts in verse 17, right? And it's just a powerful exhortation. He says, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, okay? Um, as, as ministers and as Christians, I mean, we need to, you know, we need to strongly exhort ourselves first, of course, and then consistently be, be exhorting others that we're in relationship with and in Jesus. And look at this language Paul uses, Corinne. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. Okay. Um, it, it, you know, in the body of Christ, you know, we need to consistently be building one another up and, and doing it in a, in a, you know, in, in, a, in a stronger fashion than we do, okay? It's not optional to live for Jesus. Now, I confess that, you know, there are times when I live my life like doing what Jesus would have me to do is an option. And in that behavior, it's sinful. I'm wrong, right? You know, again, we don't want pastors talking to us like this, okay? This is the Apostle Paul. He wrote the Word of God. He's, of course, a minister, right? Paul is an apostle, a prophet, a pastor, a teacher, an evangelist. He did it all, right? Um, but he says, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. What does he mean by that? And he says he insists on it. And I'll say again, um, as ministers of the gospel, you know, um, we live in a culture and in a world where no one wants us insisting on anything in Christ, but we do need to be a little more firm, right? Obviously knowing ourselves to be faulty, but we need to begin to insist in our own lives that we live more and more for Christ and then in others' lives, right? So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord 
that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do and the futility of their thinking. So what he insists on is that you stop in the ridiculous futility of your thinking. And what he's talking about there is he's not saying that if you're not in Christ, you can't, you know, you can't think intellectually, okay? Because by the common grace of God, whether people are in Christ or not, they can, you know, they can be very high and are very functioning, intelligent human beings, right? Um, and can accomplish, you know, uh, amazing things. Not for God, but by the common grace of God, you know, their intellect is, uh, you know, can be very strong and very sound and, and most of the world is, right? So what is he saying here when he insists that you no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking? The futility of their thinking is that, that they understand God or don't believe there is a God or that they're agnostic. They're saying, well, I really don't get it. I'm not sure what happened. Okay. The futility of their thinking is a thinking that's in the world today that's not in line with the Bible. Okay. Um, it's, it's obvious. He calls it futility. Okay. It's futility. It's foolish. It's ignorant. It's presumptuous. It's ridiculous. Okay. We were given the Bible, May. We're given the living word of God. And our job, Melanie, is to adjust our minds our thinking and our belief and our actions to what the scriptures say, okay? You just don't walk around and believe anything you want to believe. That's why we're given the Bible. You don't just start thinking, well, I think this is the case with God, or, you know, this is what I think about heaven, or this is what I, we're not permitted what to think, okay? We're told the truth of the reality of who God is in Jesus Christ, okay? We're told very clearly in the Bible, this is why we do what we do. This is why we're so thankful for the Bible, because the Lord has given us his word. These are the literal words of God. Although the Apostle Paul wrote this, right? It was inspired, right? The words he wrote were inspired by God the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, So any thinking that's contrary to the scriptures regarding God, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit, and who they are, and the gospel, and what Jesus has done on our behalf, and in our place, and and, and going to the cross, and dying for us, right, being punished for us, and being judged for us, and being raised from the dead, any thinking that's contrary to the scriptures and what's taught in the scriptures regarding the triune God and Christ and our redemption, our salvation, and how to live our lives, any thinking contrary to that is futile, okay? Um, Before we came to Christ, before we received Christ as our Savior, we had all kinds of ideas. Well, you know, I'm not such a bad person, and, you know, I never killed nobody, so, you know, I'm going to go to heaven, okay? That's futile because it's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that, that, Nothing we do good will take away our sin. We need a savior. We're hopeless. We're helpless. We're desperate, headed to hell. And only in humbling ourselves and receiving Christ, John 1, 12, yet to all who received him, Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Okay. So Paul insists. So if you're a Christian today, okay, um, and you still entertain you know, ideas about God that are not in the scriptures or that are contrary to the scriptures, then you just want to repent today, okay? Just go before the Lord and say, Lord, I I ask you to forgive me. I'm sorry. Cleanse me of this, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, help me to live my life and to adjust my thoughts and my thinking to the scriptures. If you're not a Christian today, then, then every thinking, every thought you have regarding God is futile. Okay. Again, this is what it says, right? This is not my opinion. We're teaching the word of God here. This is what we do, right? Um, And so you want to give your life to Christ because that's what the word of God teaches, right? The reason we believe in Jesus is because it says it in our Bible, right? It's been said that faith is taking God at his word. The Bible is 
the, the word of God, Ethan, right? So faith is when we take God at his word, right? So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. I s- insist on it in Jesus that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Okay, so again, if you're not in Christ today, anyone who's not in Christ, anyone who has not received Jesus Christ, anyone that doesn't have eternal life in Christ, anyone who's not believing and trusting and relying and clinging to Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of their sins and the salvation of their soul is in this state. They are darkened in their understanding. Without Jesus, you cannot understand anything regarding God and separated from the life of God, because only in Jesus Christ do we have eternal life, because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. So we see here that they're hardening their own hearts. We can harden our hearts and our rebellion against Jesus and against his word and against our heavenly father and against the Holy Spirit. I mean, we, we, we harden our hearts when we refuse to believe the word of God and our hearts get harder and harder. Now, still, the word of God and the gospel of God in Jesus Christ can penetrate the hardest of all hearts. But wherever you are today, if you're still just, uh, you know, if you're still just willfully rebelling against the Bible, just just repent. Just just repent of the of the audacity, I mean, of it. It's I mean, it's good to ask questions, but ultimately you want to humble yourself under the scripture, under the truth of the scripture. I mean, when you read this book, okay, there's no question that this man wrote this, okay? And when you read this, to say that I don't believe in Jesus or to say that this isn't true is to accuse this man of being just a maniacal liar, the Apostle Paul who penned this, right? Or just a complete fool, right? And when you read it, yet it's it's so clear, it's so eloquent, right? It's clear that not only does this man believe what he's saying is true, but, but there can be no doubt that it is true. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Father, I ask you to to soften our hearts today, Lord, even as believers, Father, but particularly for any unbelievers, Lord. I pray that you soften the hearts, Lord, of unbelievers, that they may receive Christ as Savior. Father, I ask you to soften my heart and soften our hearts, where even as Christians, Lord, where we're ignorant, ignorant of our own ways, Lord, ignorant of our own you know, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, foolishness, Lord, forgive me, Father. I ask you to soften our hearts, Father, and, and forgive us for the ignoring, ignorance and hardening of our own hearts. Verse 19, having lost all sensitivity. Okay, now again, he's speaking about those who are rejecting Christ. Having lost all sensitivity. Again, when you harden your hearts and you reject Christ, okay, You're not sensitive to the word of God or the spirit of God, okay? Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. If you believe you're a Christian today, but you consistently live in sexual impurity and in gross immorality, meaning you just live in consistent sexual sin, right? Whether it be fornication, which are sexual relations, um, you know, outside of marriage, um, or, you know, whether you just consistently are, are, are active in pornography with, with not only no heart to stop, but you have, you know, a continual lust for more than you really want to, 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 to question the authenticity of your conversion. Now listen, or whether you're genuinely and really a Christian. Now what am I saying? No, all of us, right, could struggle with these things. And most of us do struggle with different aspects of impurity, right? Um, But there ought to be a grief inside you. There ought to be a conviction. There ought to be at least a knowing that this behavior is wrong, okay? Um, Christians all over the world struggle with different types of sin and different types of uh, sensuality and impurity, 
Um, but it says that that they've given themselves over to it. So if you're, if you're a believer today and you've given yourself over to it again, it's just something you want to repent. You certainly want to get help. Just ask again. Just ask the Lord to help you. And again, get some brothers and sisters in Christ. Get into accountability. But there ought to be a conviction in your heart, okay, if this is the lifestyle you have. Now, if there's no conviction in your heart, okay, if you have given yourself over to sensuality and, you know, and to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more, and it's just abandoned, then you really want to go back to the foot of the cross if there's no conviction in you. If you don't acknowledge that, you know, this behavior is wrong and it's not of God and you're not trying to get well, you may want to go back to the foot of the cross and receive Jesus as your Savior anew and afresh, right? Because when we receive Christ as Savior, he comes to live inside of us, right? Um and the Spirit of God lives in us, the Holy Spirit, and he convicts us of these things. We still make mistakes. We still fall. We still sin in different ways, but we're repentant when we do these things. We don't just give ourselves over to them with no repentance, right? It's interesting what he says in verse 20. You, however, you, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Okay, so you, y'all may not know this, but you don't come to know Christ, right? by giving yourself over to sensuality, indulging in every kind of sexual impurity with a continual lust for more. That's not how you come to know Jesus, Stephen. That's not how you grow in your intimacy with, with, with Jesus, Dustin, okay? You, however, did not come to know Christ that way, okay? Um, verse 21, surely you heard of him, Jesus, and we're taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, right? So again, when you read the scriptures, when we read the New Testament, right, we see who Jesus is. Surely you have heard of him and we're taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. That's what Paul's teaching in this book. That's the teaching of the entire New Testament, right? Is we see our savior, our God, our king, right? Um, And, you know, we're taught the truth that is in Jesus from the scriptures, right? Uh, Thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. This is why we spend time in our Bible. This is why we want to be in our Bible every day. Throughout the day is because in these scriptures, we're taught in Jesus, in accordance with the truth, okay? The scriptures, the New Testament, the 27 books of the Old Testament, and even in the Old Testament, right, is also the word of God. The whole Bible is the word of God, the inspired word of God. Um, And, you know, we're taught in the scriptures. Now, in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, Jesus is on every page, right? Um, Beginning with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Right? They're, you know, they're four accounts. They're, they're historical accounts, but they're much more than history of the, the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord, all he said and did. You move over into the book of Acts, and now you have a, an account, again, an historical account. It's much more than that of the early church, all that the early church said and did, right? Um, and then you move over into, uh, into Romans, right? In 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and, and Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and so on. Um, and, you know, then you move into, you know, from telling you what happened and you move into Romans. Um, and now you have the Apostle Paul explaining to you the, the meaning of what it means that Jesus came and lived a perfect life for you and died a a torturous death for you and was raised from the dead. And, and, you know, and all the ramifications of what it means that Christ lived a perfect life in your place and died a torturous death from your, in your place and was raised from the dead. Right? So this is why we're in the scriptures. Verse 22, you were taught as, and we're being taught it right now. Verse 22, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. So in Christ, right, we, we, you know, all human beings have a nature to sin, okay? We're born with a sinful nature, right? 
I've said it before, my beautiful daughters, Kristen and Lauren, they're, they're 27 years old now. But when they were little girls, right, um, never, did, never did I have to teach them to sin. Never did I, their mother or I have to say, you know, disobey mommy, right? Be disobedient to daddy. I mean, they learned it all on their own, right? Um, because we all have a nature to sin, right? A child wants its own way, right? As adults, we want our own way. Now, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, the power of that sinful nature is taken, right? And we're given the power of Christ. But the, the sinful nature is not eradicated, okay? It's still there. And so verse 22, Paul says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. So we actually have to to put off our old self, because even as Christians, we still have sinful desires. We still can act in, in prideful ways and angry and, and bitter and certainly selfish ways, right? Um, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. So we still struggle with desires, but they're deceitful. They're lying desires. It's not how Christ is calling us to live. And we have to make an effort in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, um, Peyton, right, to, to put off these deceitful, ungodly, sinful desires. Verse 23, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. Okay, and this is what we do. This is why we spend time in the word of God, right? Um, Romans 12, one and two, right? Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may test and approve what the will of God is, is good, perfect, you know, and perfect will, right? Um, and so Paul says here in verse 23, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. The more time we spend in the word of God, the more we wash ourselves in the word of God, the more ren we're renewing our minds in the scriptures, right? Um and, and, and the more it helps us to, to put off our old way of thinking, our ungodly way of thinking and acting, right? To be made new in the attitude of your minds, verse 24, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness in holiness, right? My daughter Kristen was memorizing uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. Uh, behold, the old is gone, right? The, the, the new has come, right? Um, that's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, right? Verse 24, and to put on the new self. So if you're in Christ today, you are a new creation. You have spiritual life right? Living inside you. You've passed from spiritual death, right? My, uh, my, uh, my son-in-law, Nathan is, uh, was memorized John 5, 24, right? If anyone comes to me and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He's crossed over from death to life, right? When you genuinely receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and savior, you cross over from spiritual death to spiritual life. You become spiritually alive. You have eternal life now. Remember, eternal life is not just a quantity of life, but a quality of life. And so, but even though we have that, verse 24 says, and to put on the new self, right? We still have to, you know, get dressed, so to speak, in the new man. We are alive, but just the memory of that old man and our, our sinful nature is still pulling us toward that old man. And then we have... Uh, the devil and the demons that are that are exacerbating it, right? Now, on the other side of it, we have the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit living in us, right? Cooperating with our new regenerate spirit, pulling our soul toward Jesus, right? So you see this, this battleground here, right? For our soul, for our, our, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions, right? Your sinful nature and the devil and demons are trying to pull your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions toward ungodly, sinful, corrupt behavior where the Holy Spirit of God and your spirit are working to pull your soul, your mind, your will, and emotions your, to the new self, right? 
and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And that's where we want to live, right? We're created to be like Jesus, like our heavenly father, right? Like the Holy Spirit. Wow. All right. Verse 25, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. It's interesting. Paul says, because we are all, we're all related as Christians. We're all part of what's called the body of Christ. We're part of the bride of Christ. We're, we're related, right? Everyone who's a genuine Christian today, everyone who's received Christ as their savior and is trusting in Jesus alone for the forgiveness of their sins and the salvation of their soul is part of the body of Christ. And we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're related to every other person that's a Christian in the world. And Paul says, because we're a family of believers, you know, we need to stop lying, right? Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood. Now, again, you see, he says it's a it's something we have to cooperate with the Spirit of God to do. It just doesn't happen. We have to make a choice to put it off, just like we have to put on the new self. Again, we are, we do have eternal life, but we still have to get up and get dressed and determine to live our lives with the empowering of the Holy Spirit in that new life. Consequently, in verse 25, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood, and speak truthfully as his, to, to his neighbor. We, we, need to be, we need to be Christians who are increasingly speaking the truth, right? And he's going to tell us how to do that here in a few verses, um, which, is, which is pretty interesting. You remember when he says speaking the truth in love, right? Um, right, in verse 15, Paul said, instead... Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. Okay, so again, we have to put off, decide we're not going to speak, you know, lying. We're not going to, you know, and it's and it, it is a process because we tend to, even as believers, right? Certainly there's times I still, I could still exaggerate and embellish, right? And it's just, there's no need of it. It's not of Christ, right? It's sin. Um Forgive us, Father. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we're all members of one body. We're related to one another. We love one another. Let's stop lying, y'all. <laughs> Verse 26, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. There, there is a righteous anger, right? Um, when we're angry because... You know, um, you, you know, injustice has been done to the Lord, right? Um, when you're angry because we've been mistreated, that's not a righteous anger, okay? Um, no one, Jesus never got angry when his person was mistreated or disrespected. Jesus only got angry where, when others were being taken advantage of, and that in the name of God. Then he got angry right? Um, it's very hard for us to have a righteous anger. Again, a righteous anger can only happen in a, in a very mature Christian who has a heart for Christ, right? Um, and sees the name of Christ being mistreated and others being manipulated or mistreated, right? Through religion. Um, but so Paul says, in your anger, do not sin, okay? Generally, when we're angry, it's a man-centered anger, right? It's a, it's a human-centered anger, and it, it, it's sinful. But look at this next statement. It's interesting. Apparently, there's a time limit, and you ought to put yourself under a time limit if you do get angry or when we get angry, right? In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. You see that, Uncle Dennis? So if we're angry, if we're upset about something, right? Um, the, the terminus of it, my, my brother Jesse's word, right? Uh, there's a terminus to how long, right? There's a, there's a time that that anger needs to stop. And here it is. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. So if you get angry today, make sure you do not, you know, by the time the sun sets, you've let that anger go. You have forgiven whatever's happened. You see that? That's a that's a that's a pretty clear exhortation, right, Pop? You see that rap? In your anger to do not sin, number one. 
But if you do get angry, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, okay? Uh, most of us would confess, you know, we could stay angry for days, weeks, months, years, decades. Right, Becky? So here it is, Susan, right? Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, okay? It's a command. So whatever's happened during the day, by the time it gets dark and before you go to bed, make sure you have released that anger, you have forgiven it. I understand that the terrible things have been done, right? But, you know, uh, people belong to the Lord. They don't belong to us. And our anger, it, it's only hurting us, right? So we need to be loving and Christ-like and forgiving, as he's going to say down here in verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Just as in Christ, God forgave you, okay? If you can't forgive someone or if you won't forgive someone, make no mistake. It's because you don't know how bad you really, really are. If I can't forgive someone, and again, I know there are horrible things out there, right? People lose their children and people are killed and murdered. Um, I mean, there are horrible things, right? I picked the most horrible thing there, right? But even there, we're called to turn the individual over to Christ, give them to God, and we're called to forgive them, knowing that we ourselves are murderous sinners, metaphorically ourselves, right? That all of us are sinful and save the grace of God, right? Only hell would be our proper place. You know, I understand that's a hard word. I understand that we've been hurt and people have hurt us. Um, but again, we don't understand the hurt we've caused in our own life. And of course we understand that there is sin that's worse than others. Someone that, someone that's child that gets murdered by someone, that's, that's a greater sin than, than the selfishness we walk in. But even then we're called to release our anger. I'm not saying it's easy, right? And, and, you know, in verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in God. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Um, again, it's something we, it's, it's, it's essential to our life and walk in Jesus Christ to, uh, you know, do not let the sun go down while you are angry. And the vast majority of our anger is, is not even over big things, right? Occasionally, yes, there are some big things, but the vast majority of it is just that we were disrespected or misunderstood or mistreated, we weren't talked too nicely. I mean, seriously, forgive me, Father. So again, whatever, however it is you've been wronged, right? And I'll say it is, the 99.99999% of all wrongs are just, you know, how, how people have treated us selfishly or disrespectfully or thoughtlessly. Um, you know, they've spoken to us ways we didn't like. They didn't, they didn't keep their word, um, you know. We have to let that go. And it says here, by the time the sun goes down. So don't wake up the next day. When you wake up the next day and you're still carrying that anger, it's against the word of God, which means it's sin. Okay. And I need help in it myself. Forgive me, Father. I ask you to, to help us with this, Lord. Because look what the problem is. Verse 27. And do not give the devil a foothold. When you hold on to that anger, when you hold on to that bitterness, when you hold on to that rage, and that's why I use the crazy example it was when someone loses a child. I can't even imagine it. But when we hold on to the anger and the unforgiveness, we're giving the devil a foothold in our lives. We're not hurting the person. We're hurting ourselves by holding on to it. Now, listen, I'll say again, in the case of just these horrible things, these incomprehensible things that, that people can do to one another, murder and all these things, uh, it, you know, even then we're called to forgive, but we're forgiving on, for, for, on our behalf and we're turning the person over to Christ, which is where the, you know, which is really the only place that this can be dealt with. There was a, there was a book written that I read, I don't know, 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, I've gone through it with several people. My, my sister, Kayla Stevens, Stevens' wife, you know, uh, her and I went through it and uh, it's called The Shack. 
and it's just a horrible thing where a man's like seven year old daughter or six year old daughter was uh was captured and murdered um and it just goes through and teaches you know how the man is to learn to how the father is to learn to forgive that individual and it, and the book on Paxson does i believe a really good job at you know really what it means to forgive um you know it's got some certain other theology issues that i that i don't you know agree with but overall i felt the message of the book was really good it's called the shack i would recommend it all right and do not give the devil a foothold so again when you when you hold on to your anger and bitterness and rage and you let it pass into the next day the next week the next month the next year the next year the next decade the rest of your life we've just given the devil a foothold a stronghold in our life Verse 28, he who has been stealing must steal no longer, okay? Stop stealing, right? But must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. It's interesting here that we're just told that the reason for our hard work is not primarily to, to take care of ourselves and our bills and our family, which of course we need to do, but it's to give, right? To be a blessing to others. And it's interesting, my brother Eddie made this point in Bible study that he who has been stealing must steal no longer. Every People who steal, steal generally for themselves and their own needs and their own wants and their own desires and their own pleasures, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. So it's interesting, you steal for yourself, but you work so that you can give to others that you could give into the kingdom of God and be a blessing to those who are, are less fortunate than you are, right? Wow, right? He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Wow, thank you, Lord. Verse 29, this is a hard one. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Um, this is a hard one. Um, you know, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. I mean, sometimes I, I confess I'll get cutting up with, with, with close friends and brothers and brothers in the ministry. And, you know, we may tell a joke and, and it can be, you know, it can be unwholesome sometimes, you know, and father, I ask you to, I ask you to forgive me. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's something I work to restrain, right? But I confess that I'm not, you know, I'm not perfect at it. And again, what is unwholesome talk? This is not just speaking about, you know, using foul language and cussing, um, but just, you know, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. You know, can y'all imagine that? Now, by the way, none of us, every one of us has different aspects of unwholesome talk. Unwholesome talk, if you talk negatively about a person outside their presence, that's genuinely, that's generally unwholesome talk. So let that sink in, okay? Because, you know, there's this theory out there and there are these husband and wives and they, you know, they say things like, I, I tell my wife everything. It's unbiblical, okay? It's good to, to share the deepest intimacy and secrets with, of your heart, of your heart with your wife and with your spouse. Indeed, you ought to do that, but not of other people's lives, okay? It's not good for you to share with your wife or with your husband what others have done wrong, okay? That's gossip, okay? Um, and, you know, we have a habit of sharing not only with our, our spouse, but with our children, really with anyone who will listen we will share the negative aspects of what we believe others have done wrong or are doing wrong, right? And, and we justify it. It's unwholesome talk. It's sin. When I share something with my wife, and by the grace of God, you know, this is something the Lord has given me a grace in, more, seemingly more so than most have, um, you know, I'm certainly not perfect at it, but if I share something negative with my wife that someone said to me or someone, you know, or some, something someone did to me or said to me or how someone else was selfish or how they were selfish to other people, what have I done? I've immediately now 
painted that person in a bad light to my wife, and immediately she is going to think in certainly a negative way about them, certainly in a less positive way. Why would you lead another person into that? Why? And strain it through the conduit that, well, you know, I tell my wife or my kids, it's unbiblical, okay? So I'll say again, certainly you share, you know, whatever is in your own heart that you feel led to share, right? That's a good thing to do with your wife. But, you know, say I'm in ministry and I have a brother, you know, which I am, of course, or you're in ministry or you have you have a brother or sister that comes to you and they and they're sharing just, you know, some difficulties that they're going through or or say some sinful aspects that they've gone through. Well, they, they don't want you telling that to your wife or to other people. Right. I mean, if I'm dealing with a man and, you know, and my wife knows him and he's he's going through some different struggles with some different sins. You know, he, he's telling me that in confidence. It's certainly not for me to tell my wife that. And so what if I did tell my wife, what is she going to think? So again, there are all kinds of unwholesome talk in our lives. And as believers, there are a few things that are a bigger problem than this, right? Remember James says in James 3, the tongue is just a world of evil. And it's something we really, really, Father, I just I ask you to forgive me and I ask you to help us. You know, let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to your needs. It's not helpful for you to share with other people what's wrong with everybody else, okay? It's not helpful for you to share with other people how you've been wronged or how you've been mistreated or how you've been disrespected. And and again, I'm not saying there's never a place for this, but for the majority of it all, it's sin right? The majority of it, we're just wanting sympathy. We're wanting to bring people to our side. We're wanting to be affirmed, right? But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, okay? Again, when when we gossip, when we share negative things with our wives or our children or anybody about other people, how is that helpful in building others up? Now, listen, Of course, we need to acknowledge what's right and what's wrong. I'm not saying that, okay? If you're having a conversation and, you know, someone's speaking about something did or how did something happen, of course, we have to be able to give a a biblical judgment about it, okay? But just the purpose of sharing other people's shortcomings for the sake of it, it's unwholesome talk, and it's not helpful for building others up according to their needs, okay? Um... It says that it may benefit those who listen. Again, it's just the whole scripture is, uh, I don't know, Corinne, there's not, a, there's not a more important scripture in this Bible, right, Esther, as far as how we're to live. Look at this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Every one of us needs to needs work with that. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So again, when you're talking, when you're speaking, when you're using your mouth, How is it benefiting other people, particularly if you're speaking poorly about other people and their shortcomings? Now, again, I'll say again, there is certainly a fine line. Um, You know, we do need to be make judgments about things and call right, right and wrong, wrong. But certainly we can look into our own hearts and see where we have where we have failed in this. Certainly I can see. Verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. By the way, all of this whole, you know, all of this unwholesome talk grieves the spirit of God who lives in us and do not grieve the spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The spirit of God lives in us. He'll never leaves us. You know, we are guaranteed our redemption, our salvation in Jesus Christ, our Lord, until, until we leave this life or Jesus comes, gets us right. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Holy Spirit, I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me of unrighteousness in Jesus where I have seemingly so consistently grieved you. Forgive us, Father, and wash us in the blood of Jesus. It grieves the Holy Spirit when we, uh, you know, when we speak in a way that doesn't benefit those who listen. You know, when we hold on to our anger, right? When we live in the futility of our thinking, All of these things Paul is speaking about, when we live in this way, it's a grief to the Holy Spirit, and it should cause us conviction. 
and lead us to repentance. All of us. And finally, verse 31, right? So this is just the culmination of this. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. We have been forgiven an incomprehensible debt of sin if we've received Jesus Christ. It's in comprehensible. Anything that could possibly be done to us, right? Even up to the point that, you know, someone murders our spouse or child, as horrible as that is, the sin that we have, have, have committed against the holy God is infinitely worse. I understand that's hard to understand. That's what the Bible teaches, right? And I'll say again, Obviously, not having gone through that, I don't know what it's like, so I'm not going to make a judgment. But this is what the scripture says, right? So I'm not going to be judgmental against those that are, but this is what the scripture says. I'm not saying it's easy, right? Um, but it's it's our job to forgive people, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Just as in Christ, God forgave you to remember the debt of our sin that has been forgiven in Christ. We ought to have a lifestyle of forgiven just all the, obviously, the, 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 just the, the comparatively minor infractions done against us compared to the sin that we've committed against our Heavenly Father and have been forgiven in Christ, right? But we need to have a lifestyle. He says it's our job to get rid of all bitterness. Now, we need to cooperate with the Spirit of God, with, with the Lord Jesus who lives in us, or we can't do this. But get rid of all bitterness, right? Just, again, things that we continue to, we're continue continually upset about and angry about and bitter about. Rage. That's just Rage is just an outburst of anger. Get rid of it. Anger, right? Get rid of all anger. That's just the settled disposition of just being angry right? Anger is like a settled disposition. Rage is when you just have an, an outburst, right? Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. Brawling and slander, okay? Obviously, physical brawling and fighting is not biblical. It's not of Christ, right? It's just giving way to our base animalistic, right, uh, emotions, just, just giving ourselves over to them. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, okay? Talking about people, right? Speaking poorly about people outside their presence and saying things that may or may not even be true. Along with every form of malice. In any way, if you want harm to come to some other person, in any way, if you want bad to happen to another person, that is malice. Malice is when you desire or think thoughts in your heart and mind about bad or hurt or harm coming to another person in any way, whatever it is, right? You want other people to have trouble and difficulty and hardship, and we're told to get rid of every form of malice, no matter what it is, no matter how bad someone's been, been right? You think of Hitler, right? You just think of the worst people, Attila the Hun. Think of whoever, we need to get, we should, we cannot have any malice in our hearts. We need to turn it over to the Lord. Father, we ask you to help us today. We thank you for your word. We ask you to help us to be kind and compassionate to one another. Help us to, to, to be forgiving to each other, just as in Christ, Father, you forgave us. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I ask you to forgive us and cleanse us when unwholesome talk comes out of our mouths. Father, help us to speak only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may really benefit those who listen. Father, you know, help us in our anger to not be sinful and to not let the sun go down while we're still angry, that we might not give the devil a foothold. Father, help us not to give the devil a foothold and help us to work, Lord, not be stealing, doing useful things, Lord, with our hands and with our life, that we may have something to share with those in need, Father. Father, help us to not lie. Help us to put off falsehood and to just uh, and to be men and women of God who speak truthfully, Lord. And, and Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to, to just to not. Holy Spirit, I ask you to convict us, Lord, and to help us just to not have 
futile thinking, thinking that's outside the, uh, the word of God. Father, we love you and we bless you, Lord Jesus. We worship you and we thank you today. Holy Spirit, we ask you to seal the message to our hearts. We ask you to give us eyes that see Jesus, ears that hear him, and hearts that understand him. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.